Good morning. I would like to welcome you to the regular public meeting of the Henry County Board of Commissioners for 9 a.m. Monday, May 17, 2010. At this time, I would like to call the meeting to order and ask for an acceptance of the agenda. So moved, Chair. Have a motion by Mr. Stamey and a second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. I'd also like to welcome a new member of the board this morning, Mr. Monroe Roark. Uh, Mr. Roark has uh, graciously agreed to fill in the District 2 position in the interim between now and the end of the year until a new District 2 commissioner is elected. For those of you who are not aware, Mr. Jeffries had to resign. He, his desire was to run for the 17th Senate seat, which became vacant in order to try to protect the interests of Henry County and represent the citizens here. And in doing so, he had to resign his position as District 2 Commissioner. And Mr. Um, Roark was appointed at the last commission meeting, and we'd certainly like to welcome him on board today. At this time, we're going to move on in the agenda to a proclamation for Older Americans Month. Whereas the President of the United States has designated May as Older Americans Month and National Physical Fitness and Sports Month, and whereas it is appropriate to honor our older American adult citizens for their many contributions to the vitality and strength of our community, and whereas the United States Surgeon General has determined that regular physical activity results in significant health benefits and improved quality of life for older adults, and whereas all older adults can participate in activities that maintain and even improve their health, now therefore be it proclaimed the Henry County Board of Commissioners recognizes May as Older Americans Month and National Senior Health and Fitness Month with the theme of fitness, a life of benefits. Be it further proclaimed that the Henry County Board of Commissioners urges all our citizens to support the efforts of local organizations that encourage older adults to enhance their lives through physical activity and to recognize older adults as valuable resources in Henry County this 17th day of May 2010, the Henry County Board of Commissioners. And I know we have a number of uh, of our um, ad older adult citizens here today to receive this proclamation and I believe that we have the members of the Council on Aging here. Does anyone um, want to share a few comments about the proclamation before we assemble over here for a photograph? Susan? Charlie, you raised your hand? Yeah, come on, Charlie. Come on, Charlie. <laughs> We have a wonderful group of Council on Aging members who donate they time, their time, and this is a few of them, a majority of them, and uh, they help us to help others who are also seniors. And um, they keep active, and that's what keeps them going. We we had a dance last week uh, at the new center in um, with a uh, Locust Grove Conference Center, and we could not have fit any more in it, into there. And uh, had Mexican theme. They had a really good time, I believe. And I appreciate them being here this morning because it is a little bit early when you're retired. <laughs> but I, I appreciate you all recognizing them. They're, we did have a womanless wedding, too, and um, I think our budget should go well this year. <laughs> It was a great event. We it was. It? Mr. Basler especially enjoyed it. I know he did. He so did. Did you run pictures with him on the way? I, you know, I didn't, but I, I, I can keep those handy. That sounds like blackmail, Mr. But we do have quite a crowd. If, if they could come up and have their picture made with the board, I think they'd be honored to. Mr. Holder had a comment to make. Before you come up, uh, I'd just like to make this comment about the Council on Aging, and, and there are so many people that don't know what the Council on Aging does and what they've done for our senior citizens and the senior centers in the past. And that is, most of the FF and E of furniture fixtures and equipment that exists in those senior centers was put there by efforts of the Council on Aging with fundraisers. So it's really not all taxpayer dollars going into it. So much of the equipment, so much of the furniture, the, the fixtures in those senior centers came from the efforts of this group of, of Council on Aging. And many people don't know that, and they think it's money taken away. And to be quite honest with you, daily, 
we hear from other segments of society saying you shouldn't spend all that money on, on uh, the seniors. Well, I want them to know that all of the money that's spent there is not taxpayer dollars, and, and much of it comes from efforts such as yours at, with the Council on Aging. And I think that I wanted to say that because so many people are misinformed when it comes to how these centers are funded and, and uh, it's not a direct impact on the taxpayers on everything that they accuse us of. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, if y'all would join us here at the uh, platform, we'd like a photograph. Moving on to the next item on the agenda under tax assessors, a resolution requesting ratification of a contract with ACS Government Systems Incorporated that was approved by the Board of Assessors. Our presenter is Lawrence Street, Chief Appraiser, Exhibit Number 1. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mathis and uh, Commission members. I'm here today to ask your approval of a contract that the assessors feel is important and uh, previously signed, as you mentioned, for the annual product enhancement and uh, software agreement for the company that uh, provides us with our programs that we use to generate assessments for personal property, real estate, as well as compile the tax digest. This is an annual thing. The base cost is the same as last year with a 4% increase, which was a contractual agreement previously. And if any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Does any board mem member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? All right. If not, you have a resolution in your book, and uh, it would be for the purpose of approving the agreement, and I will entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Bowman. Second. Second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. And thank you. And I, I need to get excused to go to another meeting. Please do so. All right, um, and I was remiss in, uh, when I asked for an acceptance of the agenda. I need to, uh, someone to make a motion to amend the agenda and to add to that the item under public safety, the request award of a bid to purchase diving suits and equipment for the fire department. If someone would like to make a motion to amend the agenda and add that. Someone. A motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0, and we will go ahead and hear that at this time. Um, Mr. Brad Johnson, our Chief Brad Johnson, is going to come forward to present that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, good morning. 
The fire department recently submitted a request for purchasing for a bid acceptance for dry suits for our dive team. These dry suits we use for our dive rescue members uh, for protection during their operations. Um, ten vendors posted, uh, or certainly ten vendors is posted in the Henry County website uh, with a favorable bid coming back from Dive Rescue International for $19,105.76. Um, budget of funds we use plus 10000 of the Fairview Civic Center's donation money we use for this project. Anyone have a question or comment pertaining to this item? I do. Mr. Yes. Roark? Just for information, because a lot of folks may not realize, how often, how often do you have to use the dive equipment in a we year? We average three or four incidents per, per year. Limited on our, our capacity right now without these suits here, because our other stuff is worn, we have not replaced suits in, in, in many years. Uh, and weather, our suits now are really between May and October due to temperature and weather. By upgrading these suits and replacing out their so the old and worn suits, these suits here are dry suits and have a warming blanket. You can actually extend our, our dive period longer. That's for anything for body rest recovery, victims rescued from cars and lakes, and also helping with uh, property and evidence with the police department recover of evidence from lakes and stuff like that. So, you know, four or five times a year. I think that's more than a lot of people would realize. It is. That's why Bring that up. It is. Mr. Bowman? Just answered it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from board members? Or if not, you have a resolution before you awarding the bid to Dive Rescue International Incorporated in the amount of $19,105.76, and I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Have a motion by Mr. Stamey? Second. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks, Mr. Moving on to social services, we have a resolution requesting approval of the second amendment to the aging subgrant. Our presenter is Ms. Susan Craig, Director of Senior Services, Exhibit Number Two. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, this is an amendment that ARC is allowing us to make um, to transfer forty thousand dollars of our allocated amount from congregate meals, which are meals served in the senior center, um, to the senior center clients to our home delivered meals. Um, this will ensure that we're able to draw down every penny that we were allocated this year and that's our goal. So we're respectfully requesting that you authorize the chairman to sign these documents. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? If not, you have a resolution before you accepting the second amendment to the ARC contract for fiscal year 2010. I'll entertain a motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Stamey, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on under finance, this is a public hearing for the 2010-2011 budget. Our presenter is Mr. Mike Bush, Finance Director, and Ms. Angie Sorrow, Budget Director. You have a handout. Good morning, Chairman and Board Members. <clears throat> we started this budget process back in January, and we have, uh, we have come up with a balanced budget. Um, this was in the, I guess, eight years that I've been doing this, this is the toughest one I've ever had to, to deal with. Um, but again, we started in January. We had meetings with the, with the uh, departments. Um, we told them this would be a, a first hearing. Um, we got back and we plugged everything in. We called another time, a hearing with the departments. Some of them we had to meet with two and three times. I met with the courts three times. Um, so everybody was willing to, to come to the table and, and, and discuss issues with us, and we have, uh, we will now kind of show you what we came up with. Um, if you'll look on the very first page on sources of revenues, um, the 2010-2011 proposed budget is $117,243,352. That's $9,437,785 less than last year's budget or the one that we're currently in. That's a seven and a half percent reduction in our budget. Um, the main reason for the reduction is the economy we were in. Things are just slowly moving and uh, collection rates with the taxes, or the taxes and all have gone from 98% to 93%. So we have to take that in consideration when we adopt our budget. We don't budget for 100% of the taxes that we can collect. We have to budget for what we expect we can possibly collect. So um, as you see, property taxes make up 55% of our budget, um, 65 million down from almost 69 million last year. Sales and use taxes, we have 
brought to you for the last four months. The, um, on the first Monday of the month, we bring to you how our local option sales tax and uh, and and special special purpose local option sales tax are doing, and both of them are trending upward a little bit. You can go out on the weekends, you can't find a parking place at Lowe's or Home Depot or Town Center or Tanger, so people are out beginning to spend some money, and we're beginning to see a little bit of that, and that's why we see a, a small increase in our sales and use taxes. Uh, license and permits, um, this one is uh, permits on houses, uh, all the different licenses and things that you get with that, and we also see a small increase there. Grants, um, really don't know what the state's going to do with all their grants when we were adopting this budget, what they were going to cut out or things like that. So what we did is we adopted only the grant money that we knew we would have in this fiscal year. So every time we come to you during the year and another grant has been accepted, we'll bring it. It'll also say any budget amendment necessary to make this take place will be in there, and that number will continue to increase all year long but that's just what we know for a fact starting July 1 we'll bring in at least a million dollars in grants um, charges for services are, are up very small amount of money um, fines and forfeitures are down uh, miscellaneous revenues are basically the same and the other one that we want to look at is other sources and uses that's one where in the budget we're in right now we started the year with a seven and a half million dollar use of fund balance. We've now adjusted that to $7.3 million in fund balance. And I think at the last meeting I was here, I was showing you where if we maintain like $7.2 million in revenues and $10 million, $11 million in expenditures, that we would actually come in under that budget. So we don't expect to use seven point three. We hope to come in at several million dollars less than that, like $2 million less than that. So in the two... For those who um, may be watching this or in the audience that do not understand what fund balance is, could you please explain that? <clears throat> fund balance is, um, it is revenues that have been collected that have not been expensed at this time. It's like, it's almost like a savings account, but it's, 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 uh, um, it's just a excess uh, revenues over expenditures is basically what it boils down to. It's real hard to explain because it's not really cash. It doesn't all have to be cash, but it's just basically saying that, you know, rainy day fund, it's, it's money set aside like a savings account would be for people. Um, and in this year, I'm happy to say that with this current budget that we're proposing, we will not be using any fund balance. We'll actually be putting a small portion back into fund balance this year. Um, we have a, a policy that says that, you, that we have to maintain 25% of our operating budget in fund balance and that's to help maintain our AA2 rating and uh, the percentage right now we need to keep twenty nine million three hundred and ten thousand eight hundred thirty nine dollars in fund balance which is going to be the twenty five percent of this current year's budget and we have well at the end of this year we'll have somewhere between thirty six thirty seven million so we'll be above our, our number that we have to maintain um, but that's what we have got so far the next page shows the actual, like a pie chart of, of the exact same revenues we just discussed, the biggest piece being the property taxes. Um, and, you know, going all the way down to the very small numbers, less than 1%. The next page um, is our expenditure, basically, for the general fund. Again, it's a 7.5% reduction from what last year's uh, budget was. And each line item you see on this page you see a reduction in each and every one of them. Um, legislative executive went from 15.8 to 14.4. Judicial from 14.8 to 14.6. Uh, public safety from 61.2 to 60,000, 60,800,000. Public works went from 11.2 to 7.4. Uh, health and welfare went from 6.1 to 5.2. Cultural recreation from 7.1 to 6.5. Housing and development from 3.8 to 3 million, and other uses went from 6.3 to 4.9. Um, <clears throat> the public works section here went from 11.2 to 4 to 7.4. That's um, a lot of the resurfacing and all that, that the county does, and we're going to use um, a, a different funding source this year to to handle the resurfacing of county roads. Um, and that's why you see it coming out of that. That's why you see this number down a little from last year is because we're actually going to try to fund that through the, uh, the SPLOS department. Um, we have some leftover monies in SPLOS 2 that we're working on right now to bring you back a report 
to show exactly what we have and then also there's some money in SPLOS 3 for resurfacing that we're going to use at the same time. Um, that is basically in a nutshell the expenditures. Um, we have we had every department come in here and we had every department come to the table and cut everywhere they could. Um, the sheriff went back and negotiated the insurance or the health health care we provide for the inmates. Um, cut several hundred thousand dollars off of that number. Um, the police department, fire department, everybody, public safety came in here. They were willing to, to negotiate with us, to talk with us about things, but one of the things that we tried to do, and I think we were successful in doing, is that when, when this budget is adopted, there's not one police officer or one firefighter that is coming off the road because of the reduction of the dollars in this budget. You'll still see the same number of police officers on every shift. You'll still see the same number of firefighters on every shift. Same thing at the jail. Same, you know, we still have to maintain that jail. <clears throat> we have, we have included in this budget um, a, a four-day furlough for county employees. All county employees will be furloughed for four days. At this point, we haven't made the decision on on the date of those four days. But we will make that decision and you know get with you to see if you can agree to to what we come up with um and that's that's kind of why we're having this meeting today we have another one two weeks from now this is to present this to you and to the public that this is what we're suggesting that we do and then you'll adopt it i think two two weeks from now you'll adopt this on the on the 28th of, of may um and you know any time between now and then we're available for any questions you, you may possibly have um that's basically our operating budget, um, the general fund. That's the main fund that we have in the county. Um, we have several other funds that have to have an adoption every year, too. And we'll start with the um, special revenue funds, the law library fund. Um, this is money that comes into the courts. The courts maintain this fund. Um, and we just have to adopt it because it's a special revenue in our account. So we basically go to them, and they tell us they expect 171000 in revenues, and the expenditures will match that. Um, this is to update law books in the law, in the law library. They, uh, they have been kind enough to help us in some of the purchases of computers and software that doesn't have that didn't come out of the general fund that, that they have purchased for us this past year. So that's what the law library fund does. The next one is the NSP program, the neighborhood stabilization program. Last year we started this with a zero budget um, and we came back in mid-year and adjusted it to seven and a half million. We'll come back at the end of the year and adjust that again to the actual revenues and expenditures that were spent. So just to just to set a budget, because you have to have a, be a beginning budget, we've set it at a million dollars. And we'll come back periodically during the year and provide you information. I do know that we uh, have purchased uh, 59 homes. We had 61 under contract, and two of them we decided not to purchase based on the expenses that it would take to fix the house up, and you wouldn't be able to, to sell the house for the cost. So we bought 59 houses, and I think we're down to 12. So we have done very well over the last several months, um, and uh, you know we'll sell these next 12 and see where we go from and there. This program was funded by a grant. This is a grant funding, yes, ma'am. We need to clarify that. Yes, um, E911 fund. This is um, you have two real um, revenue sources here. One's your landline, and the other one is every time you pay your cell phone bill. There's a certain fee that's charged to the cell phone so that you can call 911 at any given time. Um, there's a little bit of interest here and appropriated fund balance to match the expenditures expected to happen in this year. This fund is, uh, it provides for itself. It does not have any additional funds given to it by the general fund. We were providing money early on in the, well, I'll say four or five years ago, we were having to provide money, but now they actually provide enough money on their own to maintain their operations. So it's a, uh, no effect on the general fund. The next fund was a new one that was created um, mid-year last year. Um, the Law Enforcement Grant Fund, this is where a lot of these new grants that came out from the ARRA, um, they, they required you to have a trust fund set up or a separate fund to account for all the expenditures and revenues that come in. And so we set this fund up last year. Um, and. We're asking to set it up again this year, and we're just we're putting a budget in here for the recovery JAG at the Sheriff's Department. There will be police department grants, the heat grant, things like that, that will come in this year that will increase this number. But to set a budget, we went out there and set what we knew was going to cover over 
carry over into the next fiscal year. So that's what the law enforcement, and again, that's, there's no money there. Anything that's spent here is grant related. There's nothing that we have to spend out of our general fund for this fund. Um, the next one is the uh, victim witness special revenue fund. This maintains several different uh, funding sources, drug abuse treatment funds, that's the date funds that, that you've been, uh, got some information on the past couple of months, uh, jail construction and staffing, victim witness, um, those are the three main components that make up this. This is add-on fees to, to um, court fines and things like that. Um, I was in a meeting the other day on the drug abuse um, fund, and three years ago we were averaging $4,000 a month in interest. We were averaging less than $200 a month on interest. So that's one of the reasons why you see in the general fund the same way. We've seen such interest rates are so low that on a million five hundred thousand dollar amount of money we have in the bank we're making less than two hundred dollars a month um, on that money sitting there so that was an interesting thing i thought i would mention um this fund also takes care of itself a lot of these expenditures are transfers they go to uh, debt service for the jail that we bought the jail construction staffing goes toward the jail the uh the drug abuse funds those are the ones that right now are going to fund um uh, uh, scholarships for people to go to different uh, rehabs and things like that to keep them out of the jail you know they're doing some stuff like that there's also the mental health court or the probate resource court um, it is it has been funded in the past two years by 50 percent date funds and we've actually got some concrete data now that that nearly 80 percent of the um, participants for that mental health court have some kind of drug dependencies or, or issues and we have upped that funding from 50 percent to 75 percent this year so that's another thing that we took an expense away from the general fund and funded it through these through these date funds um, victim witness that's an add-on fee that we get we're allowed to retain some of that to offset the cost of our public our uh, solicitor and our da's um, cost um, again, there's, there's a little bit of fund balance and some interest. Expenses, like I said, were transfers, which are debt service. Uh, the DA's uh, victim witness, DA and solicitor's victim witness, that's what makes up the victim witness special revenue fund. Again, none of that is general fund related. There's all for that special fund. Technology funds, um, our state court created a uh, technology fund at the state now I want to think there's maybe Henry County and one other county in the state that has this five dollar add-on fee um, and they they purchase all computers all technic technological needs that they have they purchase it out of here they do not ask for any funds from the general fund um, for this fund and they purchase stuff for the state court I think they've bought some uh, some stuff for for all the different courts if there was a need they were able to help fund a computer or a printer or something in those those needs um, and that's what makes up that fund uh, juvenile assistance fund this is a very small fund it's got mediation fees supervision fees substance abuse fees again these are little tack on fees that are added to um, to different you know probation um, dollars that, that these people pay and it's to offset the expenditures of having our people our probation people there to handle those type needs again it's a sixty three thousand dollar a year uh, budget but it has to have adopted budget and that's why we have it in here today um, economic development this is the um, development authority um, last year they had a budget of 352,000 this year they have a budget of 320,000 one of the things we did to help cut some of these costs is we moved the development authority back in this building from where it was housed um, out by where the water authority is and that was a rental property that we were using so we brought them in here to help cut cost and we cut their budget by thirty-two thousand dollars this past year um, Henry County hotel motel tax fund <clears throat> we, we had a resolution the other day to uh, increase that from five percent to eight percent this budget is based on a five percent because at the time when we were creating this we haven't heard back as to what what that number is going to be um, there are I think seven hotels that are in the county um, they will generate about three hundred thirty six thousand dollars worth of that five percent tax money and uh, it's right now that breakdown is 174,000 to the general fund and 162,000 to the Chamber of Commerce for that visitors bureau that they have there. And we do have to um, the the chamber comes in once a year and has to explain what their budget is, what they're going to use this money for, and we use this money in the same form that they do. Um, 
it's three hundred thirty six thousand dollars a year and that number will increase it will be increased once if the eight percent is passed and i haven't heard if it has or not as of yet but if it does it's almost a two hundred thousand dollar increase in revenues that will be split between us and a agency that we deem responsible for it um, the next fund is an impact fee fund last year we went and changed our policy on how we collect the impact fees it went from when you came in to get a building permit you pay for your impact fee now it's when you come to get your certificate of occupancy is when we actually when you actually start using those services that's when you're going to pay for those services um, so it's, it's a little harder now to track than it was before we could track it because we knew how many permits were sold it still comes in every month and we are expecting 252,000 uh, this year um, and we will be using a lot of fund balance that was built up over the years when it was generating much more money than it is today um, and then we have transfers which most of this money is for debt service for the jail for um, purchases of recreational properties and things like that so this fund right here still has enough money to maintain itself there's no general fund um, additional money needed um, with this program the next one is our stormwater fund um, you can see that we went down on the the collection fees and that's because of the the rate at which we collect taxes we wanted to make sure we didn't over budget for revenues and then allow expenditures to come in higher and not be able to fund them so basically what we did is we had 2.7 million in collections uh, we used $134,000 in fund balance and then we had a little interest to offset the expenditures that they came up with this for this year some of these expenditures that you see on here will be one-time capital project capital and nature expenditures where we may buy a dump truck or another uh, uh, piece of equipment I know that they come in and they bring in really good deals they, they really look for it to find the good deals so that way they can keep their costs down as much as they can that's what they've done this year's you see their cost last year were 3.1 million in expenditures and this year's 2.8 so they're they're also um, working to keep the budget down now this is a completely separate this is also a separate revenue source from our general fund this is billed on your tax bill every year as a fee it is not a tax it is a fee um, the next one is the capital budgets um, this one here is uh, the reason we budgeted this one is we have a lease purchase that will end this year and we show that seven hundred thirty one thousand dollars for some vehicles that we bought over the past couple of years and this is uh, the only thing that we have in that particular fund this year that will happen um, I think we have a little bit of money in there for any kind of emergency needs for capital but it's very small um, again that's a seven hundred thirty one thousand dollar budget which is basically going to be an operating transfer from the general fund to this fund to pay for it out of the correct fund the next fund we have is the debt service fund um, as you can tell last year in 2009-10 our debt service was 8.1 million in 2010 11 at 16.8 million the difference is uh, the SPLOS program we currently have we issued 70 million dollars in bonds and we had to add that debt service which we didn't pay we didn't have it last year this is our first payment on those bonds for 8.5 million dollars so basically our, our debt service has doubled but the only reason it doubled is because we added a new debt that we didn't have last year um, and it, you can tell that we actually went from general fund transfer from 6.6 .6 to 4.2 so we were able to reduce that one uh, the capital transfers in there uh, impact fees again you can every one of these numbers that you see transfers in from impact fees you can go back to the impact fee budget and find that same number that transfers in so our debt service is 16 million this year more than half of it is our splossed bonds and our last one is a narcotics fund this is an interesting one the state of Georgia says that you have to adopt a budget for every special revenue fund this is a special revenue fund federal law says you cannot adopt a budget for narcotics collected money so what do we do we adopt a budget with zero and we come back at the end of the year and whatever we actually spent or brought in revenue wise we'll put in there and same thing with expenses we'll record that that is uh, all the funds that, that have to have a hearing um, we are uh, happy to say that it is a balanced budget um, and we will entertain any questions that you all might have at this just time. for clarity's sake 09 budget was and the 10 11 budget is those are the two numbers I think at the end of yes. the day we're all 09 
budget was $126,681,137. 2010-11 is $117,243,352, a decrease of 7.5% or $9.4 million. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Stamey? Mike, just for a point of a clarification, I had this question asked to me last week. Um, when you talk about the four-day furlough days, are we talking about 32 hours or are we talking about four days? Because in the fire department, their days are 24 hours, and they would be losing 96 hours. We're basically saying if, if you have a holiday, how many hours is your holiday? Mine's eight. Police department has 10-hour shifts, eight-hour shifts. Police sheriff's, I mean, the, the fire department, they work on 12-hour shifts. So it would be four 12-hour shifts, not 24 hours. They're still charging them 48 hours, and everybody else will be charged 32 hours. Correct. It, it's whatever your four days equal. If you work 12-hour days, you're going to take four 12-hour days off. It's just, and the fire department is calculated at a different rate. Their pay, you know, our pay is based on 80 hours a week, 80 hours every two weeks. Theirs is based on 106 hours every two weeks. So it, it equals out to where they, they feel the same reduction that anybody else feels. It's the same dollar amount applied. Same percentage dollar. Percentage yes, dollar yes. amount. Correct. And we're taking that reduction based upon over the 12, pay, uh, 12 months, right? That is correct. Okay. Mr. Seem, Mike, it would seem that, uh, you know, to be fair, that we can calculate the hourly rate of each of those employees, and each employee pays 32 hours. So I, I don't think to, to uh, have the fire department pay 48 hours because of 24 and 24. I don't think that would be fair, as, as my, and I don't think that the uh, police department who are on 10-hour days, I mean, a holiday is a holiday. It would seem to me that we could uh, calculate the hours, come up with a 32-hour dollar amount, and that's what they should be. It should be across the board. If, if, a, if a, you know, one of, a, one of the one of our people is on an eight-hour day, then I don't, I don't think we should hit the fire department nor the police department for any more money than what the others would have to be paid. And it shouldn't be that hard of, to do. I don't, I, don't I don't think it is that hard to do. Right now, a, a county employee, myself, I work 20, 20, 80, 2,080 hours a year. Okay, So we take my four days, divided it by that number, and came up with a percentage. Fire department works 2,280 hours a year because of their shifts work. And so that same percentage that I'm feeling, we have calculated that they feel. Now, if, you want, if we want to go back and just say we're just going to take eight hours, you know, that may be, we, we can look at that, we'll definitely look at it, but it may affect the way that we do the furlough days in the fire department a little bit. Well, it would seem that you would... Uh we can talk about this at another time, I'm yeah. sure. But it would seem that you would be able to take that dollar amount, whatever that dollar amount would be, and and divide it over the amount of pay periods they have and then have that dollar amount come out of each pay period so as not to be a large amount of money coming out at any one time or being, you know, not being paid for a holiday or whatever. I mean, the holidays for police and fire are a lot different than they are for for you know administrative purposes because right. you know this is it's tough to make those work out but uh. and we are working on exactly what you just talked about one of the things is you have fair labor standards law um, and we got to work on that and read that law a little bit more because they can't work 40 hours and me only pay them for 36 hours that that's a little bit of a problem for anybody even even the regular employees but we are working on that to try to come up with something that is that is beneficial well, that is equally shared among all 1,700, 1,800 employees that we currently have in the county. Okay. So if I'm hearing you right, I think um, I'm, that you, basically what you're saying is in your calculations, it's under the Fair Labor Act that the, the percentage reduction is easier to do than a day deduction over a 12-month period. I, I guess basically what I'm saying is currently – for the way that the, that the law works, if I take a furlough day, it's an eight-hour day that I'm not going to get paid for. I'm going to be off, but I'm not going to work, so I'm not getting paid for that day. So, therefore, on an 80-hour paycheck, I would work 72 hours. It is 
I, I have to be very careful what we do because at, and normally I would get paid 72 hours for that pay period. So I would take that eight hour day. I would lose that eight hour day during that pay period. You know, to begin with, we were talking about taking all four furlough days back to back to back to back. And that was going to be a 32 hour reduction on an 80 hour paycheck. And one of the things that we were going to discuss and see if we could do is look at making only a few hours per paycheck spread it out over time which is when we run into the problem with if you work 80 hours i have to pay you 80 hours you can't get paid less than that unless there's some kind of a contract between you and 1700 different people so it, it becomes a little bit of a you know like a paper jam if you want to call it that but it's something that we haven't you know totally for, said no that can't be done and we're working with each department to find out how they can actually work this thing out now two of the holidays that we're talking about are two of the furlough days come in months where there are three paychecks so that's going to help a little bit um it's just the other two that may be you know a little bit more of a you know feeling it but if people know up front now where it's at they may can you know adjust their budgets tweak them a little bit especially on those weeks when you get three paychecks um i know for an example for myself i use one of those three paychecks i base my, my budget on two paychecks a month and my personal budget and then i have three paychecks twice a month one of my use for christmas one of my use to try to go on vacation um and i realize not everybody does that i know i've talked to some people they they base their budget on on every two weeks so every two weeks a bill is paid so you know every other check a house notes paid every other check a car note is paid so some of those people would have a little bit more difficult time than than my situation that i was in but you know, if we let them know up front, this is how it's going to be. And, they, and, and I have had not the first complaint about the, the four days. They, people have been calling in, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, they were concerned about, you know, 13 days, 5% cut in pay. There was all kind of thing, rumors out there. And we've tried to squash all those and basically let everybody know that right now we're looking at four days. And right now, tentatively, we've got, we would like to do them like, uh, uh, like the Monday or Friday before a holiday and make it a four day weekend. It gives us a, you know two things. It gives us the impact of the building being the buildings being shut down except for public safety for you know two X two days at a time in, with a weekend in between. Um, and you know we're we've trying to spread those things out to where none of them come back to back. Um, you know we we were looking at Labor Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day potentially Good Friday and Memorial Day. So two in one calendar year, two in another calendar year, but all fall within our physical year. Um, that's what we're looking at at this point, and, you know, we're waiting on information back from different departments. And, you know, the courts are a little bit different than, than the county. They have some um, – they've already got calendars out there, but they're actually working to try to match those four days with us, and I think most of them already have matched them. There's one or two courts that are still out there that have calendars that we're working on. And then you have public safety. And for an example, for the fire department, uh, Chief Johnson has worked diligently with us, and he has come up with, if, if push came to shove, he, he could furlough his entire staff for eight days, which we didn't ask for eight days. We were asking for four days. And what they did is they went in there and they calculated out, you know, if you've got to have, say, 25 people on a shift and we have 28, we have a couple people a day that could take a furlough day. Um, and it worked out to where he can get those in. One of the questions that came up was people were going to get furloughed on the weeks when they had their Kelly days, which is basically they work so many hours that every now and then they get an overtime check because of that. Well, we've able, by only using four, we've been able to skip every person's Kelly day. So they will still continue to get that um, additional pay for the Kelly days that they work. So, like I said, everybody has come in here and, and you know, the, the sheriff, he's come in and he said they will take their days. You know, he will have, you know, they, they already calculate in vacation and sick leave and their formulas for their days, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're going to go ahead and calculate in the four-day furlough, and he'll get four-day furlough from every one of his jailers. Um, and, and like I say, it's been a very positive people come back and you know, said that that's great. They they would there's that's much easier. I had several people, several single mothers who work for the county that emailed me thanking us for, um, you know, trying to do a furlough versus a cut and pay, and it only being four days versus, you know, at one time we were looking 13 to 15 days based on you know the revenue shortfalls that we had, and and now we've got it. I think to where we can do four days and be okay. I just want to comment, um, and a lot of citizens may not realize this, but the sheriff and the courts and the DA's office are not subject to what 
we do here as a county. They they don't have to follow our lead or, or what we feel like is in the best interest. They have that option of, of choosing for their own departments as constitutionals. But every one of them have stepped up and they have found creative ways to cut their budget. Um, they have, I think they've gone above and beyond. I, I really want to say how wonderful it is to be in a county where everybody works together for the good of our citizens and we don't have the animosity that other counties have, especially between the commissioners and the sheriff. We have a great working relationship and, and my hat's off to them and, and I'm very appreciative of, of what they're trying to do to help us in these tight budget times. They, they've, they've done a great job of working with us. And one other thing I'd like to add is <clears throat> this budget package, <clears throat> every meeting that we have, we have, we had a team, a budget team, that took notes, that made phone calls, that looked up everything for anybody who needed stuff, and that was Angie Sorrow, Brenda Bennett, and Connie Mitchell. And those three people need to be commended just time and time again and I, because, you know, I, I'm, I was in the majority of the meetings, but other things pulled me away, and somebody had to keep that boat afloat and going in the right direction and these ladies just did an amazing job and i would like to thank them now um, for that work that they've done any other questions or comments for board from board members before i ask for public comment mr holder mr bush uh, i think it's very important for and i think you're very much aware of it public safety employees are different from regular employees they fall under different guidelines and different laws. Uh, as a why, one of the reasons is with the shifts that they work, many of them are afforded the opportunity for second jobs. And most, many of them have second jobs. Police officers have opportunities for additional work. Where a normal employee, eight hours a day, five days a week, is not afforded that. So some of that is taken into consideration in the law. Um, another thing, as far as the balancing of this budget, I know it's all based on proposals and, and estimates. To fund this budget, I know there's like a 0.75 millage increase. That is projected on what the information we're getting from the taxes, tax assessors as to what the tax digest will generate. Is that not correct? That is correct. So by the time the tax digest comes in, which is long past the time or the deadline for adopting a budget, that adjustment may, have, may be made. This is what we're projecting it to be. But when the tax digest comes in, it could be more, probably not, but it could be less. Is that correct? That is very correct. When the digest is actually set, which will be in August. in August. So we have to adopt this budget. We're supposed to adopt it, you know, end of May, beginning of June. So we've got several months there between when the actual digest is set, which is then that calculates what the millage will be, you know, when we sit here and work these numbers out. So we think worst case scenario, and this is Again, this is not 100%, but worst case scenario, it would be the 0.75. Because once that digest is set and we recalculate the numbers to get the dollars that we need here, it could be 0 0.71, 0 0.69. It could be any different number once that digest is exactly. absolutely set. Because when we were working on these numbers, you know, the tax valuations have now gone out. So we will now start working on those cumulative reports, you know, personal property versus, you know, real estate property and ad valorem taxes it's, there's all different it's a it's a very complicated Absolutely. process and that's why we're we're sitting here working on a number that has been moving on us all year long it's been moving downward on all the you know residential properties i think i think on the digest based on the 2009 digest we've lost almost a billion dollars worth of value um, on real estate property that's residential that doesn't even count commercial this year. And, and since our last meeting, I know a, a reassessment notices have gone out and probably everybody in this room has received one. And on residential property, it could be as high as 30, sometimes maybe even 40% reduction. Mm -hmm. And on commercial, it may be three or four. So that's where the balance comes back into play of the 16% or the 19% that, that we're planning for in this budget as a reduction. 
One thing that uh, I want to make in the public meeting, and I think we've already discussed part of this as, in his comments that I've received in the last week, and that is the four 10-hour day work week so that we could close this building. Obviously, public safety, as we know, falls under a different category again. But a four 10-hour day work week, we know what it, the, the projections are that the cost savings would be on closing for one whole day. Have you plugged that into a, a, as part of a budget? At this point, we have not. That That is something that's still under consideration. If some of the departments of four, four 10 hour days would work, some of them, it, you know, won't work. If, if you've got permits, you know, and the time changes, you know, you're going to be working at dark because you don't have 10 hours a day of sunlight. Um, you know, some of them we could, like in my office, you know, we're in, in an office. I could work four 10 hour days. We could work four 10 hour days. Um, I don't know that that's the same, that is true for every single department in the county if they could work four 10 hour days. You know, one of the things we had heard was something about, um, you know, working like uh, four nines and then a four on the Friday, a short day on Friday or Monday, or keeping the office open all week, but some of them would take Monday off, some would take Friday off, and, and there would really be no savings in that situation. The only way their savings would be to really close the door one day a week. On, a, on four 10-hour days and that's it's it's it it sounds like it work, would work and it we think it will work for a lot of places but in a Overall. in many different places that we got to calculate in how that works it, it's going to take us a little bit of time and we got to have the departments help us as well and, and that's that's kind of where we're at right now one of the things in this budget some of our cuts in this budget I want to say this up front um, you know we had um, an attrition line item in the budget which is basically where a position is held, someone leaves, the time between that person leaves and the time somebody else comes to work, whatever the dollar savings are there, that's something that we're not going to, we can't really pinpoint that's going to be, we're going to have this much money on July 1. It's going to be over the full budget. So some of these things that we're thinking about, we may adopt it now here, but we may be able to adjust it later in, into the year because we're going to be working on a lot of different things all year long on finding unique ways to make this budget even better. Also, <clears throat> there, um, we have a longevity, every two-year longevity. We have had in the budget since, probably since I was here in 2002. Um, for this next two years, we are freezing that 1% longevity. Um, our goal would be to come back after those two years are up and give a 2% longevity to make up for the 1% based on just because it's just not enough uh, revenues in here to flow to make that happen. Um, if we don't, if we're unable to do a two percent, maybe we can do a one and a half for the next four and get it back. But right now we had to freeze that, and that's going to save almost um, almost eight hundred thousand dollars per year. Um, so that's something that uh, you know we really don't want to do it, but that was one of the ways we we could cut the budget, and that's what we had to do. So. One one last question for me, and it's just more of a comment. And <clears throat> once again, to reiterate. Public Works and the big hit that it's taken if someone looks at that budget and they see an 11.2 to a 7.4 million dollar reduction and they're stuck in traffic out here or they can't get from point A to point B but they see somebody playing in a park or they see a policeman sitting drinking coffee or a fireman fishing a DOT worker's doing nothing Fishing on duty? <laughs> <laughs> that may be the best example. I think it's very exact, as a matter of fact. But um, these are things that really raise concerns mm -hmm. of taxpayers. And uh, of course, we are the ones that are going to be the sounding board that comes back and has to hear these these concerns that. You cut my taxes, but yet look at this. Are we not? You didn't cut this area, but you've cut the most vital, which everyone is affected by transportation. So we just need to reiterate the fact that even though that's a seven 
four million, five million dollar reduction, almost a fifty percent reduction in 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 uh, fifty one point eight nine percent, as a matter of fact. That it's going to be replenished by another funding source, so that we not we're not looking at that much of a reduction. I think it needs some explanation to the people, okay. because otherwise. Uh, we will hear from it. Here's, we, we were struggling with that ourselves. We could have placed this in the budget. There was $2 million for asphalt, and we're going to just make this, we'll say $2 million for salaries and $2 million for asphalt. Let's just say it was $4 million. We could have left that $4 million in the general fund budget and shown a operating transfer in of $4 million coming from our SPLOST funds. When you do that, what happens is you don't show the true savings um, in this budget that we're showing of 9.4. So whereas that $4 million moved from the general fund to the SPLOS fund, it will still be spent, and it is still a viable money. So really, DOT does have an $11 million budget or $12 million budget, but it's just being funded from a different source. So you will see the DOT out there uh, resurfacing 30 miles of roads this coming year. Um, and, and you'll know no different other than we're telling you now that it's going to be funded out of a different source. I, and I understand that. One thing that, um, and I, I don't want to sound sour grapes or anything, but it, it's, it's been a concern of mine and has been for many years. You just look at the 09-10 budget or the 10-11 budget, and you look at the amount that Public Works or Department of Transportation has in the whole scope of things. And when we sit here and hear the greatest concerns that we have as a board that we hear today, traffic, traffic, traffic. Okay, what percentage of the budget is of next year's budget or even this year's budget goes to transportation or public works compared to public safety or compared to the judicial system? compared to this to the legislative executives division look at it i mean it's pretty self-explanatory we will never catch up and, and improve our infrastructure as long as we don't budget and fund more for that area it's just that pure and simple and this is a terrible time to have to add more to it but these are concerns that the people have right and all of us are stuck in traffic at some point in time. I, I agree with that completely, and I know we have this comment back and forth every year. That's why we do put 70% of our SPLOST funds toward roads to help offset. We may get a road paved that otherwise it might have taken 10 years to get paved if it was going to have to be paved by the general fund. But, you know, you know, like, for example, Eagles Landing Parkway, I don't know if we'd have ever been able to pave it through general fund dollars like we're being able to do it through SPLOST dollars. So. To me, it's not a, it's it's not comparing apples to apples, but it's kind of adding a little bit to the DOT budget. So we are getting more work well, it done. Does. But yeah, it does. but I agree, it is a very small portion. Like it's six point three seven percent of next year's budget is DOT. And if you added the 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 four or five million dollars back, it would be more like eleven percent. So even even if it's in there, it's only eleven percent of a okay, full budget. Okay, at eleven percent. Uh, let's just do it in in dollars. Okay, uh, culture and recreation, six and a half million. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, in, and in the entire public works, it's only it's 7.4. So almost the same to play as it is to work. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not taking anything away from recreation because I'm certainly an advocate of rec recreation. But people have to move too and travel, so this it's, it's it's tough, and I know that it is, and I understand the splost issue, and that does raise the level. But even with the splost infusion, we still are low on public works. I think Terry Mickle would say amen to that. <laughs> That's all I think. I think that just reinforces how important that SPLOST program is. I mean, currently we have close to $50 million in transportation projects under construction, certainly not a, not something that we could pull out of general fund. Um, so I'm, I know the citizens are going to benefit from all of those improvements, intersection improvements and road widening projects. So. Any other board member have a question or comment about this? 
All right, at this time, we are going to call for public comments. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to step forward and comment on the proposed 2010-2011 budget? Okay, let the re record reflect that no one has come forward to speak on the proposed budget. And we're, this is a non-action item, and we will have two additional, is it two additional public meetings on this? One additional one, one, public meeting on this yes, before this, adoption. Yes, the next one will be a called meeting on Friday, the May 28th. Um, to adopt the budget. Um, so. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Moving on to SPLOS, the first item is a resolution requesting approval of a supplemental agreement for the construction of South Bethany Road. Our presenter is Rocky Romero, SPLOS Transportation Director, and that's exhibit number three. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. South Bethany Road from Jackson Street to West Price Drive is a designated SPLOS 3 transportation project. Staff is requesting approval of a supplemental agreement in the amount of $92,469.77 for additional work due to field conditions. The resolution in your hand contains the list of items needed to do the work. Funding for this project is available in the project budget. I'll take any, any questions. Any comment? I'd just like to make a comment about it, Madam Chair. I think this, nobody likes to have additional cost involved in a project. But this is a situation where they actually ran into some bad dirt uh, along Car uh, South Bethany in the vicinity of Carvin Drive. And uh, that's why you, you see all of the geo grid and all of the stuff that they had to go in and basically uh, there's underground springs, and the water table was this is probably higher right now than it's been. And I'm glad, in a way, that it was so that it, we found it now, rather right. than built the road and then the road uh, go away. This is a project. This South Bethany slash Bowden Street is a is a joint splice project that the City of Locust Grove is contributing a half a million dollars to, I believe. That's correct. And it would be the road that would go by the Locust Grove Conference Center and ultimately give a northwest route that would be paved at some point with another section of South Bethany from uh, Highway 81 in Bethany Church all the way to Locust Grove. You know, it would be paved. So. Yes, that, that's, that's my comment. I think this one is one that certainly we, we have to do, without a doubt. Any other questions or comments? If not, Mr. Holder, I'll look to you for a motion on the approval for a supplemental agreement. Approved. Have a motion and a second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item is a resolution requesting approval of a budget amendment transferring funds from Peaksville Road at State Route 42 to South Ola Road, Exhibit Number 4. South Ola is a designated plus to transportation project, a budget amendment in the amount of $123,308 is needed to cover the construction and related costs for the traffic signal installation for Peaksville Road at South Ola. Funding for this, pro for this project uh, is available under the SPLUS2 Pixville at State Route 2 account. Any questions or comments pertaining to this item? I'd just like to Mr. make Cole. another comment, Madam Chair. The, the transfer of these funds is still along Pixville Road, but this South Ola and Pixville intersection was a SPLUS2 transportation project. And uh, Locust Grove High School and Middle School is located at this location now, so it has become very vital and very most important that a traffic signal be installed before the school begins in August, August July, August, whenever the new August school year starts, because there will be a senior class at Locust Grove High School this upcoming year, and you'll have even more teenage drivers driving there. So been several accidents. The accident history, I think, certainly shows that a traffic signal is needed there. And we had some cost savings at uh, the 42 at Peaksville. 42 in Peaksville, which was, in fact, funded entirely by SPLOST, even though it's a U.S. 23, Georgia 42 route. Is that correct? That's correct. Is that sound? That's very much south of McDonough, and that's why it was, had to be funded by SPLOST funds. 
any other questions or comments? All right, Mr. Holder, I will look to you for a motion on, on this item. I much move to approve. Have a motion to approve. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. The next item is a resolution requesting award of a bid for the traffic signal installation at the intersection of Peaksville Road at South Ola Road, and that's going to be exhibit number five. Yes, ma'am. Uh, seal bids were solicited for the traffic signal installation at the intersection. Uh, we received three seal bids, uh, and we reviewed them, and staff recommends the low bidder, Moy Electric Company, Inc., in the amount of $111,643 dollars and 33 cents and we do have the budget since you approved the previous one any questions or comments mr mr holder now this uh this bit of moy electric company and the bid documents showed that this uh signal would be operational by august 1 is that correct there was a condition on the bid package that that it was it needed to be it, it, we gave them a hundred and 20 days, which is more than August 1st, but there was a condition in there that the, by means of putting at least a temporary cabinet, it had to be operational. But by the, signal, by, the signals the would signal be operational by August, 1st. by August 1. That's why we put, That's the put in the con, con, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? All right, if not, Mr. Holder, there's a resolution awarding the bid to Moy Electric in the amount of $111,643.33. Have a motion and a second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. The next item is also under SPLOS to resolution requesting approval of a budget amendment transferring fun funds from East Atlanta Road at Thurman Road and from DOT Capital Road Projects to East Atlanta Road at Panola Road, and that's exhibit number six. East Atlanta Road at Panola Road is a designated SPLOS 3 transportation project. Uh, a budget amendment in the amount of $646,630 is needed to cover the construction and related costs. Funding for this project budget amendment is available in the SPLOS 3 East Atlanta Road, uh, at Thurman Road, and at the DOT Capital Road Projects account. Uh, if you look, there's a breakdown on how much each, uh, coming from DOT, account there's two hundred sixty nine thousand nine hundred thirty two dollars and coming from East Atlanta Thurman there's a three hundred seventy six thousand six hundred and ninety eight dollars uh, for the, that grand total of uh, six six hundred forty six thousand six hundred thirty dollars on this item because this is a SPLOS 3 project. Why are funds um, being taken out of the DOT capital road projects for this and not from SPLOS funds? DOT actually started this project back, I want to say back in 2006. Uh, so it was a DOT project design was started on DOT and there was some money for also for right away. Uh, once SPLOS 3 passed, we included, we knew County DOT has started the design, so we included this project on the SPLOS project. So that's why we, we're using the DOT account to finish this project. All right, well, I guess my concern is with the budget crunch and with the DOT budget being such as it is, if this could be fully funded out of SPLOS 3, it would certainly preserve those funds for other road issues that are not on the SPLOS 3 list that may crop up during the year and I know there was substantial savings from Eagles Land and Parkway that will be going back into the 5th district um, to fund projects there so that my question would be why can't those funds come solely from SPLOS 3? Well, I think we're trying to use that district and uh, I don't think Eagles Landing I don't think they have anybody has mentioned of how the decision of moving the money has not come yet so for this purpose of this project we we thought this was the best best idea. Commissioner Matthews, Chairman Matthews, this is coming out of the capital project fund, not the general fund. This money was earmarked several years ago. Uh, each each district got so much money and can earmark money for certain things. This was something that the District 5 commissioner at that time had earmarked that money for, so that's why it was thought that it would be used because he, that is the money that is in his district, and it is his district money to use in the capital project fund. That's why that was that piece was actually pulled out because it was in our capital projects fund, in our 
fund balance, if you will, to actually build that portion of the road. So that's why we actually pulled that into this particular road to help make sure that that was funded. Any questions or comments? All right, if not, you have a resolution before you um, for a budget amendment and transference of those funds, and I'll look to Mr. Basler for a motion. So moved, Madam Chair. Have a motion by Mr. Basler, second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The final item is a resolution requesting award of a bid for the construction of the intersection improvement of East Atlanta Road at Panola Road, and that's going to be exhibit number seven. Seal bids were solicited uh, for the construction of the intersection improvement of East Atlanta Road at Panola Road. Uh, 12, 12 seal bids were received and reviewed. Staff recommends the low bidder ISC Incorporated in the amount of $978,187.50. Funding for this project is now available. Any questions or comments pertaining to this item? All right, if not, we do have the award of the bid for the construction of East Atlanta at Panola Road, $974,187.50, and I will um, entertain a motion. So moved, Madam Motion by Mr. Basler. Second. Second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? The motion carries 5-0. Madam Chair, I have a comment or a question for Terry on this. Where this road is coming back out into East Atlanta Road, it dead ends right into Twin Oaks subdivision. There had been a lot of discussion here some year and a half or at least a year ago about the what we was doing at the end of, I think it's Leland Cypress or it's at the end of the Twin Oaks. Where are we at on, on that project right there? We've completed the design of the, the Hammerhead cul-de-sac. Yes, sir. Um, I believe all the right-of-way has been acquired. We are now moving a couple of utilities out of the way so we can build that. I anticipate that probably starting in a in a couple of weeks. As soon as we get those utilities out of the way, we're ready to, to build that um, turnaround. That was a very important decision, and, and we had a lot of discussion in here with the citizens who live in that subdivision, and they was very concerned, so I want to be sure that we, we stay on top of that, because the last thing we need is, is a, a thoroughfare, and that's what we agreed to do, so we want to be sure we get that done before this thing gets off and running. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is going to be a legislative update. Our presenter is Mr. Rufus Montgomery, Vice President for Cornerstone Communications. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, arrangement here. My name is Rufus Montgomery. I'm with Cornerstone Communications Group. Uh, my colleague, uh, where's Jet? Where do you go? Jet, if you'll come join me at the podium. Uh, Jet Tony is the founder of our, our company. We both provide representation for you down at the Capitol as you retained us for governmental affairs services in November of last year. A lot of this stuff will uh, put you to sleep, but I'll try to get, to it, get through it as quickly as I can. But I think there's some items of importance that uh, you will come to quickly appreciate. We looked as a firm at your commission priorities in going before the Georgia General Assembly in our first session, providing your representation, um, with the top priority being your requested local legislation, the second being transportation appropriations, and the third being general appropriations. And given in mind that this is the worst budget climate that we've seen in our lifetimes, we again approached it with no promises, but with the idea that we would look to make sure that when they talk about the major metro Atlanta counties, Often you hear Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton, DeKalb, and sometimes Clayton. We wanted to make sure that when that mix and when, that, when those conversations occurred, that Henry County was always included in that conversation. As a firm, um, our responsibility was to uh, determine what the priority issues were from you as a board, 
come up with a strategy to make it work, communicate that to the legislators and members of the executive branch and the, uh, the General Assembly, then to guide the tactics and actions to make it go, and then also to come back in an accountable way, and that's why we're here today, to measure the progress on those issues. The uh, couple facts about this year's legislative session, it was the longest session in 120 years, uh, began in January, ended April 29th. Uh, two years ago, uh, well, the state budget was $3.3 billion less than it was two years ago. For fiscal year 2009, the budget was uh, $21.2 billion. And for this year, the fiscal year 2011, it dropped down to 17.9. Other dynamics that were important uh, to note is that there's new leadership in the, in the House, in the Georgia House, with a new speaker, a new speaker pro tem, a new majority whip, uh, a new uh, majority caucus chairman, and then shakeups at the committee level that involve multiple committee chairmen. It's the final session of a two-term governor, and it's an election year. So these were the dynamics we had to that, that influenced what we did on, on your behalf before the General Assembly. Uh, another primary uh, responsibility of our firm is to interact with the Henry County Legislative Delegation, of which uh, Steve Davis is chairman, with uh, Representative Ron Mayo being the vice chairman. On the House side, there are six uh, representatives, and on the Senate side, there are three. The local delegation has requirements to get local uh, legislation passed, and given that, that it was a top priority, we had to familiarize ourselves with those rules. On the House side, all local legislation will require the approval of four representatives, four of the six, and then on the Senate side, it requires the approval of two senators. You, as a board, passed unanimous resolutions uh, requesting the introduction of legislation. We got those from you, and as a firm, we uh, transmitted copies to each member of the delegation. We did so each time electronically and in writing. Some of the local legislation was also accompanied by, uh, or excuse me, legislation was also accompanied by letters from the, the chairman and from you as a board. Uh, a priority, House Bill 1347, redevelopment powers, your request was for approval of a, uh, for a voter referendum to determine whether you would be able to exercise redevelopment powers under Georgia's redevelopment powers law. Um, being diplomatic about it, um, there, was, uh, an ex uh, there was a great deal of effort put into to getting this piece of local legislation moved. That's generally not the case. Uh, 60 or 70 jurisdictions uh, have passed nearly identical language as requested by the county and we had to navigate the waters with regard to the local delegation. Although you had eight of the nine members who uh, were in favor of allowing the county to exercise its prerogative to provide services for the county in, in, the, in the way that it sees fit, you did have one member who happened to be the chairman that um, uh, disagreed and uh, amended the language originally submitted by the county. As that language went to the Senate side, uh, the chairman, and Commissioners uh, Stamey and Commissioners Jeffries uh, came to the Capitol and were very instrumental in presenting the case of the county before the delegation. The Senate side agreed to switch it back to the original language of the county, and then there was a process called an agree-disagree in which the uh, four of the six House members by local delegation rule had to approve it and what they had to approve the Senate substitute in what they call the agree-disagree. All of these, this local legislation goes up for what they call a local calendar vote. Uh, was, it passed 144 to 1. There was one dissenting vote from Henry County. Representative Davis voted against it. It passed on a local calendar in the Senate, 46 to nothing. And it was sent to the governor on the 3rd of this month. We will be pending uh, governor's signature. A second bill, House Bill 1470, again, local legislation that will increase the hotel motel tax from 5% to 8%. It's, it, the purpose was, was, was clear. Some folks talk about tax increases, but when you look at Henry County as compared to the other counties in the, in the Atlanta metro area where some have as high as 12 percent, this is just something that allows uh, Henry to come to the base level of what, where, where the other counties are. Uh, pretty reasonable request. It was, um, there was a minor change to the county's language that was added to put it in line with model legislation when these things go to legislative council. Legislative Council has done hundreds of, of these types of bills, and so they, uh, they just they made a slight modification to the language. 
Five of the House members sponsored the bill, and then the Senate members approved it, passed on the local calendar, 155 to 1. That was not the other member from House, I mean, from uh, Henry County. That was Representative Austin Scott, who's now running for Congress, was running for governor at the time, passed on the Senate side 50 to nothing, and was sent to the governor on the 4th of this month. A third bill, and this is an example of uh, our work with your staff and members of your team. We, as a firm, did not uh, primarily work on this. Janet Shelnut looked to have this uh, provision that requires your board members to resign, repealed. It's my understanding it had been attempted to get you try to get this done before, but uh, she was able to work directly with Representative Lunsford, get, the, get it introduced, and get it passed through the delegation. It's also awaiting the governor's uh, signature. It passed in the House with no dissent, 157 to 0, and 42 to nothing on the, on the Senate side. But the repeal of the resign to run provision is a, it was, it's just a common sense thing. On none of the, the three bills did we anticipate a, a problem with the uh, governor's office. Generally, with a signed resolution from the local uh, governing body and passage from the local dele delegation, there's generally not problems out of the governor's office. Appropriations, appropriations, appropriations. I-75, managed lane from uh, State Route 155 to State Route 138. The governor presented a $300 million bond package uh, to the legislature in his budget this year for statewide transportation freight projects, um, $80 million for managed lanes in Henry County, which would allow an additional lane to the middle coming through Henry for traffic congestion. Uh, we personally advocated for this bill with, uh, we, at our estimate, was 94 uh, legislators. It was an easy sell. The idea is that this is not a Henry County issue. This is a regional and a state issue, and that's how we presented it. When you look at specific counties in the worst budget climate, people were really taking shots at folks when it looked like money was going directly to individual uh, counties. And so, again, this became a state issue. The, the General Assembly cut that down to $200 million. But on the governor's prioritized uh, project list, there is a port project that's $120 million, with Henry County's project ranking second at $80 million, and the total of those are $200 million. And we tread lightly in saying that the, the GDOT board uh, retains the uh, ability or the final authority to approve these projects. So it's not, a, not necessarily a done deal because the initial, the initial $300 million that the, the GDOT board knew about has now been cut to 200. So they still, we still anticipate them approving the 80 million, but it does um, lie with the prerogative and the will of the board. And so we'll continue that process uh, at, in an upcoming board member meeting is when they will move to the process of approving those two projects. A second project, and your chairman was uh, very upfront in uh, the retention of our uh, firm in that um, it was important to demonstrate uh, value to the citizens of Henry County and also to this board by looking at uh, specific or direct appropriations, particularly in the area of transportation. As Commissioner Holder just mentioned, transportation, traffic, it's a problem, it's a problem, it's a problem. Last year, the General Assembly passed a bill, Senate Bill 200, which allowed for a, the establishment of a planning division and the establishment of a director of planning. And that director of planning is required to present a prioritized capital construction project list each year. There, there are no uh, rules here or there in terms of what he can or should put on the list. It's, it's, his, it's his prerogative. He submits that to the governor. The governor submits it to the legislature. Uh, this year, that list provides for $26 million to fund these improvements at I-75 and, and Jodico Road. And that is an appropriation that was included. It's, it's not specifically broken out in the budget but it is something that the GDOT board has already approved and, and that, that is something that you can count on coming, coming your way. Legislation of interest without uh, uh, getting down or too deep into the weeds, I'm gonna run through some bills that, are, that we believe would be of interest to Henry County, a big one being the regional transportation sales tax. And I'll state up front as I run through these, uh, there were some fights to be had and there were some fights that we did not engage on your behalf. I mean, it's. Uh, as you understand the political uh, arena, there are some, if we're here on, on one bill and we oppose this legislator, it could hurt you over here with an appropriation, it could hurt you over here in, in just different areas. So we had to pick and choose based on what we thought were uh, ha having, having dogs in the fight. This was a big bill, everyone was involved in this one. But briefly, 
Uh, this allows for 1% transportation sales tax regionally. Uh, the, except for the regions that opt out, they're going to have a, you'll hold a referendum statewide on this in July 2012. The regions have, uh, they're based on the regional commission boundaries and the projects are developed in each region based on the state priorities and local input. Uh, there's a regional roundtable that's going to be made up of county chairs and mayors that will be put together this fall. And the roundtables will meet to approve a project list or they may decide to opt out of the tax and the voters can also reject the tax in their particular regions. Uh, minimum match requirements for drying on the dollars, they're going to be higher in the regions that opt out and where voters don't approve the tax. And then the percentage of the overall funds that are raised in each region will be returned directly to counties and cities based upon a, a modified LARP formula for discretionary transportation projects. The, we'll provide a summary that uh, is a little bit more detailed um, with regard to that transportation bill and a couple of others and any that you specifically want to look at. Again, of the hundreds of bills, we decided to pick out a couple we thought might be of interest to you. This gun carry bill, again, there was a, a push to get this done this session and it rewrites the law with regard to uh, public, uh, regarding daily weapons and, and, and public gatherings. Again, it's, um, it even allows you as a board or an entity to go to a private area and to convene and to have the definition being covered there. But uh, the small thing that became a big thing with many of the gun folks is that the application fee will, will double from $15 to $30. The Senate Bill 354, uh, it allows you to abandon a road when you determine it's in the public's best interest. Currently, you have to, you can only do this when uh, you determine as a board that there's no substantial public purpose. State Resolution 821 is a, constitution, a proposed constitutional amendment. It gives the DOT um, the ability to have an ex exception to the requirement that state agencies have cash in hand prior to letting the contracts. The department uh, can enter into multi-year construction agreements and it can rely on future anticipated funds to pay for future phases of projects. I keep going back to, and I keep mentioning his name, Commissioner Holder, but uh, as all of you know, traffic, 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 and it's been a, it's been a problem. Again, this is something that was considered a good bill. All of these bills were championed by ACCG, by the way. House Bill 122, this is going to require you to send a PDF of your budget to the Carl Vinson Institute 30 days after you adopt it. House Bill 1196 um, prohibits the uh, counties from acquiring fire sprinklers and homes. Again, this is a bill, this is an example, again, uh, we've weighed in on big things, but it's a, it's a small thing, but it, it kind of it puts up more of a burden on counties. It prohibits you as a County from adopting building codes requiring fire sprinklers to be installed in single family dwellings or duplexes. We have to determine which fights to take and which ones, and this wasn't a, that wasn't a fight to, to take. House Bill 1055, I could spend two or three hours briefing you on this bill. This is an example of how, I guess some would say, how sausage is made, the way the bill started and the way the bill ended, two different, just, just two different pieces of, of legislation. The purpose was to update fees uh, in different areas in the Georgia Code to ensure that they reflect the cost of what it costs to the government. If you're providing a service for $100 and it costs you $200, all this is doing is allowing you to update the, the fees in that area. But there was another bill attached to it, a hospital provider um, fee uh, bill that was attached to it as well, and we'll provide a summary uh, with more detail. Senate Bill 339, it allows utility contractors to bid on projects without having the license. It's self-explanatory. It makes it unlawful for a county to refuse to allow a, a properly licensed utility contractor to bid on a project if they don't have a license. Again, these were some of the bills that weren't necessarily favorable to the county, but they weren't the big fights. Senate Bill 447 gives preference to in-state contractors and builders when it doesn't impair quality and cost considerations. It requires anyone who contracts with a county for service, for physical performance of services to supply the county with the identity of all subcontractors along with their sworn e-verify affidavits and it provides a penalty on contractors and subcontractors for non-compliance. Uh, the Georgia Trauma Trust Fund is very important. Uh, Senate Resolution 277 proposes a constitutional amendment. Another thing that was important uh, to your chairman and to you as a board as you uh, communicated to us was to work on funding for uh, trauma in Georgia. This is will create a dedicated funding source for trauma care through a $10 fee on motor vehicles and it's expected to generate about $80 million a year to go toward trauma care in Georgia. Moving forward, the 2010 election season in the 
Georgia General Assembly in the House, there are 27 incumbents who are not running again, and there are 62 who face a primary or a general election challenge. In the Senate, there are 13 who are not running again, and 20 who face a primary or general election challenge. Brought that up for the obvious reason that the General Assembly is going to look a bit different next year based on the, the turnover. <clears throat> the Henry County delegation, and I'll just take a moment to I guess give uh, kudos to Representative John Lunsford. The things that you asked for this year, uh, and we were not trying to take away from what we do for you as a firm, but the things that you asked for primarily happened as a result of, of John Lunsford's intervention. He, um, when we ran into problems or challenges within the delegation, John Lunsford retains the, um, the command and respect of not only the members of the local delegation, but members of the leadership down at the General Assembly, and he'll be sorely missed, not only by us as a firm, but but the county in terms of his leadership. He served as chairman of the House Special Committee on Small Business Development and Job Creation, and as you know, he is retiring. Senator John Douglas as well, when that information went to the uh, Senate with the language change that you requested, John Douglas was the one that stood up in the meeting and said, hey, look, we're going to change it back. And we're going to change it back, not because it's, it's whether he agreed or disagreed with it. He just agreed with the fact that the county should be able to do what it does. He specifically said, you don't come to tell him what he does, and he's not going to try to tell you how to run your county. And so he spoke up, stood tall on that one. He was chairman of the, he's uh, currently chairman of the Senate Veterans Military and Homeland Security Committee. And he's stepping down, of course, to run for um, public service commissioner. Senator Gail Buckner is also a candidate for statewide office, which leads us to the rest of the delegation and how this is going to look going into the next legislative session. Chairman Yates was uh, first elected in 89. He lost after his first term, but um, that first term combined with the last 18 years gives him 20 years, which will make him the, the senior member of the delegation in terms of seniority. But we thought it was important to note that the next senior person has eight years, Representative Howard Mosby, he's a member of the minority. Representative Steve Davis with six years. Senator Emanuel Jones with six years, again, a member of the minority in the Georgia Senate. Representative Glenn Baker and Representative Ron Mayo, both members of the minority with, uh, with very few years in terms of being able to, t to influence the process down there. So things will look different in terms of the clout of the Henry County legislat uh, legislative delegation going into the next session. Board priorities, priorities, CCG, Cornerstone Communications Group, and slash board priorities. We work for you. We work at your direction and we strive to, to give the best advice that we can give with regard to how we believe we can move forward uh, your priorities as presented by our board. Job one right now would be governor's approval of the uh, redevelopment powers local legislation and then also approval of the hotel motel tax legislation. Uh, approval of the budget which everyone tends to want to have a hand in. We don't see where the governor would take out the things that he recommended given that the 26.3 million was, was recommended by his person, his hand-picked um, uh, director of planning, and also the money for the managed lands. Even the governor has commented that he's been caught in that Henry County, what they, what they call Henry County traffic coming on a Friday trying to leave Atlanta headed south. Uh, final approval of the 80 million of the managed lanes, and then coordination with GDOT for the 26.3 million with the uh, Jodico Road I-75 interchange. That uh, concludes uh, my presentation at this time, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I have a question for you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. And I appreciate the communications throughout the entire session that, that we've had. Um, of course, the census numbers are going to be coming in. And from those numbers, reapportionment is going to take place. How vulnerable is Henry County with junior people freshmen, if you will, going in to represent us at state level when it comes to, to reapportionment? It would put, uh, or in my opinion, and again, these are just uh, uh, things we've thought through, Madam Chair, in terms of moving forward with regard to uh, reapportionment, uh, one being how Henry County is represented by folks who don't, who don't live in the county. I mean, there's a, it's a catch-22. If you limited it to just the county boundaries and cut it down to maybe two or three districts, the question is, would that give you more clout or, or less clout? And, but then the other question is, if you have members of the minority party who are taking pieces of Henry but don't have a vested interest, they don't live here, I mean, are those folks also in a position to work in your interest? So 
I believe it does put you to directly answer your question. I do believe it does put Henry County in a more vulnerable position compared to say counties who have more senior members. And we look forward as a firm to working with you as a board to um, uh, craft a, a strategy to, to address this, particularly in a, in a way that you feel is important, uh, the way that you feel will best benefit the citizens of Henry County. Any questions or comments from board members? Mr. Holder. Montgomery, you had mentioned that the $80 million lane project was the second. And the gov yes, sir, on the governor's uh, statewide uh, transportation freight projects prioritized list. Right. There was a. What was the first? The first one was the, um, and, and, and thank you for your question. The first one is the uh, $120 million to go down to the, the well, Ports Authority. To the Ports Authority. Uh, to the Ports Authority and expansion of the port down there in Savannah and, and, and lanes coming into it. Wasn't, I wasn't uh, uh, intricately familiar with the details of the project, but this is what I do know. The, the reason that that became a priority is that it's also considered a revenue generator for the state sure. versus the, the pass-through with Henry. Now, our argument was that when people sit in, Henry, in traffic in Henry County, that it's a, there's an environmental cost through the congestion that's caused from the cars sitting there. There's a public safety cost. Uh, if, if folks have uh, an emergency out there, it's harder to get to them based on the traffic that's sitting out there. There's an economic development cost that now some of the local folks may like the fact that it's, it's congested out there and people get off of the interstates. But at the end of the day, when you look at something like the race or you look at just impeding traffic through the county, there becomes an economic development cost. So we tried to expand our, our argument in favor of, of Henry County on this project. Uh, couldn't compete with the the ports and that it was a consensus that that would be the, the the number one priority going in But that would make it number two on the prioritized list and also and I can understand the ports But with the congestion here in Henry County many of that those uh, trucks headed are headed where to those to ports. the port Absolutely, I mean because that's it's certainly the route that it's going to be taken Okay, that's what I that was a good point because I was going to say, you know, we're even though the port is in Savannah, Henry County's economy is 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 solidly tied to the ports of Savannah, um, with with our distribution centers that are located here and the pass through traffic. So, really, those are not, in my opinion, two separate issues. And, and, and excuse me, uh, Chairman, but also driving that route whenever you want to drive it from it, starting in Atlanta, starting at the capital. And you head to the ports. Where is one of the last areas of congestion you're going to see before you get to Jekyll or to Savannah or to St. Simons? Well, it's going to be right here in Henry County. Once you get into Butts and to Macon and, and it starts to split off, the traffic flows. So it's anybody that's traveled that knows the problem that exists in the I-675, 75 merge and, and the congestion that is, exists here in Henry County. So I think that's good, and I hope it'll be funded. Well, for the record, I, I should also tell you that I became a fan of that port project, by the way. Um, when the options were considered from $300 million down to zero, I immediately became a, a fan and a proponent of the $120 million for the port project, but also the addition, knowing that that one would be funded before the Henry County project. So I, it's probably on record somewhere that I have spoke in favor of that of that project but for the, again for the purposes of, of getting the second project funded as well well and our legislators are very aware of it too because I spent a day up there meeting different ones from South Georgia and every one of them um, when I was introduced as being from Henry County said oh yes I'm very familiar with the traffic in Henry County so they they, they know the issues that exist here and I think that's going to be to our benefit all right. Um, well, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate the presentation. Appreciate your work during the session. We appreciate the opportunity to continue to serve you and the board. Thank you. Mr. County Manager, any comments for public session? I, I just have one thing. Uh, going back to the budget discussion, I'd just like to say that we had two primary guiding principles when we started this uh, uh, the budget process. One, we were going to try to save jobs, avoid layoffs. And two, we wanted to try to get to an equal level of sacrifice from all parties involved in this budget situation. Uh, that equality, Commissioner Bowman, is important. It's, it was important when we discussed the uh, public safety budget and layoffs with all department heads, including Chief Nichols and Chief Lacey. And we can, we have a need for a 
another shorter Board of Commission work session on the budget because there have been a lot of, we put a lot of fine points on the budget discussion with several department heads over the, over the past few weeks. And at that time, we can kind of go into uh, more specifics as far as the furlough and salary adjustments. And uh, um, I, I think that will be a good time. I think every, all the uh, final questions will be answered at that time. Appreciate that. Ms. Wiley, any comments? No, ma'am. Did anyone sign up for public comment? The upcoming meetings and events will be tomorrow, May 18th at 6.30 p.m., a regular board meeting. Friday, May 28th at 9 a.m., a called meeting to adopt the 2010-2011 budget. Monday, May 31st, all county offices will be closed in observance of Memorial Day. And I believe that we do have a Memorial Day um, event scheduled for Heritage Park on that day. And you can check the county website for more information on that. Tuesday, June 1st at 9 a.m., we have a regular board meeting. At this time, I do need a motion to convene into executive session for the purposes of uh, potential pending litigation, personnel matters, and land acquisition. So, motion by Mr. Stamey. Second. Second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. I need a motion to reconvene into public session. So moved. Motion by Mr. Stamey. Second. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. At this time, I need a motion for an approval of an affidavit and resolution pertaining to executive session. So motion second. by Mr. Holder. Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. At this time, I believe we need to amend the agenda um, out of public necessity. Mr. Roark? Uh, yes. We need... Um, we need to uh, amend the agenda to uh, adopt a resolution for a land acquisition. Okay, and um, does there do we need to do the land description on that? Do the whole thing. Do it now. Or, mm -hmm. Okay. We ready? So amend the agenda and ask for approval of land acquisition for, and go okay. ahead and read that. Okay. Move that we adopt a resolution to authorize the acquisition of 0 .2066 acres of right-of-way, more or less, in land lot 240 of the 6th District um, by negotiated contract or condemnation pursuant to provisions of OCGA Section 32-3-4 through 32-3-19. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. If there's no further business to come before this board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Salute. Motion by Mr. Roark. Need a second. second by Mr. Basler, who is ready for lunch. I knew that wouldn't last long. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. We stand adjourned. <laughs>